<laughs> Hello, everyone. This is another episode of Fire Breathing Rob. For the people that listen to us on the air, thanks so much. And for the people that listen to us on YouTube, keep punching out our channel, subscribe, and also share these videos there with important people that have amazing stories to tell. So thanks so much for listening, regardless of where it is. I have a guest today called Neil Bascom. He is an author and an award-winning national and international bestseller uh, for many books, but also for the book we're talking about right now. It's called Faster, How a Jewish Driver and Also an American Harris Beat Hitler on the Racetrack. So Neil, thanks so much for, great, for your time. We greatly appreciate it. Awesome. Excited to talk to you. All right. So Neil, can you tell the viewers that don't know you a little bit about yourself? Sure, I'm an author of narrative nonfiction. Uh, I've written a number of different kinds of books, uh, everything from Roger Bannister breaking the four minute mile to skyscraper wars in New York, uh, to hunting Nazis in Argentina, uh, to this book, uh, Faster, about uh, sort of the golden era of Grand Prix racing. How do you choose what you write about for your books? Well, I generally, you know, it's, it's one to the next. I don't have a, a certain sort of a set design on the kind of books that I write. It's really more the particular stories. I kind of write mini histories, meaning they're sort of small, uh, particular stories that I paint sort of larger picture over. Um, you know, most of them, to be perfectly honest, are kind of David and Goliath stories. I'm sort of constantly reliving uh, uh, Red Dawn um, that I watched uh, as, as a kid. And it's just, you know, whatever is sort of hitting me at the moment, and generally the books take about three years. So there's a lot of time there where, you know, I'm considering, you know, is this the kind of story that I want to invest the next uh, three years of my life with? So, you know, it tends to be a pretty big decision. Right. So you have written quite a few books on Nazis and World War II. What drives your interest as far as that aspect goes in writing books about Nazis and World War II? You know, I mean, you know, going back to this David and Goliath uh, theme, you know, I mean, you really have, you know, various moments and various stories within World War II that sort of exemplify that. Um, you know, I wrote Hunting Eichmann about capturing Adolf Eichmann, largely because I was close to a survivor in college and the story of, of his capture and the trial sort of very much resonated with me. And I wrote the story of Faster, largely because I was fascinated by this period of motorsport, which was really the time where cars went from 100 miles per hour to 250 miles an hour with no according for safety. You know, they're still wearing cloth helmets, uh, no harnesses. You know, you stay in the car by bracing your legs against the side of the cockpit. So it was this very dangerous, very dramatic uh, period and moment in time. And you have this kind of Jesse Owens-like story with this Jewish driver, uh, Rene Dreyfus. And how did all these people come together? Can you talk about that? That, you know, an American Harris, a race car driver. I mean, these are people that you wouldn't think really would hang out with each other. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was fun to sort of f find that path. And I love that you asked that question. Like, you know, Rene Dreyfus, for instance, was uh, very much a, you know, a top Grand Prix driver. He, uh, his father was Jewish, his mother was Catholic. Uh, in 1930, he sort of erupted on the Grand Prix racing scene and was one of the best drivers until the sort of rise of nationalism uh, in Europe. And the best teams like the Italians and the Germans banned him from racing, uh, removed him from their teams because of his Jewish heritage. So he found himself by 1935, 1936, really being kind of like a jockey without a horse. Um, and really couldn't find a car to race in. And that's where, you, that's where Lucy Shell enters. Now, Lucy, who was probably, you know, of all the books that I've written, most of them tend to, to are, are about men. Uh, so it was fun, so fun to write about this, this really dynamic, uh, willful, just incredible woman in Lucy Shell. She was uh, very rich. She could have lived a life of absolute leisure in Paris and in the U.S., but she found herself falling in love with motorsport uh, in the late 20s. And she was probably the best, one of the top two uh, best uh, Monte Carlo rally drivers. She was a speed queen. She was very tough. 
But by 35, 36, at the same time that Rene found himself without a car, Lucy found herself sort of aging out of being a race car driver. But she still had a ton of money and still was super invested in, in motorsport. And so she decides to launch her own Grand Prix racing team uh, to take on the Germans. And she needed a driver. And in order, uh, the best drivers were all with the best teams and the best cars, except for Rene Dreyfus. And so that's really how the two came together and formed this really incredible alliance. Uh, we talk about motorsports, and I know you brought that up in the previous questions of how Lu Lucy got involved in that and in general, how that affects the story. When I think of motorsports, I think of NASCAR, but I don't think of that being huge in the 1930s and the 1940s you know, during that World War II era in World War I. I think of soccer as far as being a world sport and still was, you know, the most popular sport in the world, I believe. So can you tell the viewers, Neil, why motorsports was so big in Germany and all around the world in the 30s and the 40s? Well, it was. I mean, it, it, I was sort of under that impression, too. I, I mean, I, I knew the Grand Prix racing uh, right was a decent sized sport during that time, but I had no idea like just the enormity and the popularity of it and how it was really kind of like one of the probably top two or three sports. Um, huge crowds, hundreds of thousands of people were attending each of these races. Uh, they were front page news. It just was enormous. And it's largely um, a factor of, you know, cars were introduced in, in Europe um, you know, as soon as, as soon as people were inventing cars and, uh, they were started racing in, in town to town races. And so that evolved, uh, in Europe very early before really anywhere else. And it became just, you know, this enormous sport and it had really everything, you know, it had danger, it had speed, it had glamour, it had this sort of very visceral, like you're in there in the moment. And it just was a absolutely captivating uh, sport and it was a very nationalistic one as well. Uh, so with that being said, Neil, uh, to extend on that, uh, why did Hitler love motorsports? Just because of the nationalism that you just spoke about or was there something else that he was really into as far as motorsports? Well, I think it, had, it was a lot of things really. Uh, first of all, I, he, you know, he was a bit of a car fanatic. Uh, in his office, he actually had a, a, a portrait of Henry Ford. Um, when he was campaigning across Europe to rise to power, uh, he drove a Mercedes everywhere because to him it, it sort of emanated power and respectability. And when he rose to power, the second speech he ever gave uh, in 1933 after becoming the, the, really the Fuhrer of Germany, um, he made revitalizing the German automobile industry sort of the top thing he wanted to do because one, it would help the economy. And two, it would sort of raise the prestige of Germany overall. Uh, so he, he endeavored to build the Autobahn. He started plans to build the people's car, the Volkswagen. Uh, and he also, at that first speech, said that I want to rule and dominate motorsport. And that was really propaganda. <clears throat> he wanted to do that to prove, you know, um, that Germany was the best. So we talk about all these firsts uh, coming on. Would you believe that she was a first as far as the racing world of what she did and how she made this story come together? Yeah, I mean, without question. I mean, she was the first woman to own, fund, run, lead a Grand Prix race team, period. And she was very successful at it. And, you know, part of the story is really – of, of faster is, is, is telling her how she took on the Germans really in 1938 and, and won. And so she was a, she was a pioneer uh, and she faced all the sexism that I imagine your hitting coach uh, faced as well, where men discount her. And when she was successful, didn't give her any of the credit. Many, many, many times they gave, uh, they said in the newspapers <clears throat> that her team was run by her husband, Lori. Uh, when in fact, Lori was, was just a supporter. So um, she really uh, was remarkable. And it's sort of one of the big pleasures of writing this book is kind of restoring her place, uh, at least in motorsport history.
Uh, Neil, with the world in chaos and, you know, this, and we talk about history and we're supposed to learn from historical events in the past so we don't repeat it. Uh, with that being said, and this is a great book as far as telling the history of what happened in World War II and as far as, you know, sports and how it affected World War II. Can you talk about the lessons that you believe the reader should learn from reading this book? Yeah, I mean, what I would say is, you know, like you asked earlier in the interview, like, you know, the kinds of books that I write. One, I want the, book, the books that I write to kind of inspire people. Uh, and, I, and I really feel like, you know, for Renee and Lucy, in this period of time, right when, you know, Hitler was abusing the Jews and rising nationalism and being more aggressive, you know, they were race car drivers and, you know, um, motorsport fanatics. But they took that, they took this field they were in and fought the fight where they could fight it and made a mark where they could. And so, you know, if I was to say I want anybody to sort of take out of this is, you know, is to make it make an impact in the world in which you live. Do you see uh, similarities of what went on in uh, Germany in the 1930s and 40s to what's going on in the U.S. and the world right now? Yeah, I mean, I think... Uh, racism for all its uh, permutations is, is, is largely the same anytime you face it. It's making uh, someone different than you, someone other than you, uh, a threat um, and to dehumanize them uh, largely because of your own fears or insecurities. Um, and so whether it's Hitler and, and, and the Nazis to, to Jews uh, or white supremacists uh, with African Americans or today with coronavirus um, sort of scapegoating Asians in general as a population for uh, what is a, a molecular uh, virus, uh, you know. So yeah, I think racism sort of unfortunately is one of those things that is very difficult to stamp out, but it's appearance is, is often very similar. No. So what advice firstly would you give uh, young people uh, so they get involved in reading and writing such as yourself? Yeah, I, 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 again, I, that's an awesome question because I, I haven't, don't think I've been asked that in a very long time. And I, you know, a lot of my books uh, are published first as an adult books and then there's a young adult version for, for junior high kids and, and high school kids. So for instance, Faster will be The Racers and will come out from Scholastic in the fall. And the thing I would say to, to reader, to, to young people who don't feel like they like to read uh, is don't necessarily assign that because you're, you know, your, your school assigns you a book and you don't like that particular subject matter and so you don't like reading. There are so many books on so many different things. Um, there are graphic novels, there are books that I write, nonfiction sort of narrative thrillers, there's sci-fi, there's fantasy, there's just so much awesome material books out there and just try them all till you find something that you love, uh, that you like, a story, a character or whatever, uh, and then just read everything in that. And you'll find that the more you read, uh, the easier it is, the more you'll love it, and you'll broaden your, your interest. But, but read things that you wanna read. Um, so lastly, what advice would you give young, young readers that you know, do love to read and write? Um, well, it, I guess if you wanna be a writer, um, write, I think, is probably the best advice I ever got, was just keep writing, you know, keep a journal, um, sit yourself down in the chair or wherever you are and, and just keep writing and, and read a lot. I mean, I, that's really the, the best way. I mean, that, you know, reading and writing schools, yeah, that helps. But um, if you want to, if you want to sort of pursue this, you got to do both of those things first and foremost. Agreed. Great advice and nice and simple for us too. Very simple. Read and write. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Neil, uh, to end the interview, uh, where can people find more about you and your books and also what you're doing? Sure. They can go to my website, which is neilbascom.com, N-E-A-L-B-A-S-C-O-M-B.com. 
or you can find me on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or I'm, I'm very Googleable, if that's a word. Neil, thanks so much for the interview and thanks so much for your time. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks, Rob. It's been fun.